Hi, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist and welcome to another COVID-19 debunking video. This pandemic has been going on for almost two years now, and there is one major reason why it is still going on in developed nations, and that is disinformation. So in this video, I'm going to be going over claims made by some of the people who are responsible for some of this disinformation. The names I'll be going over in this video are well known to COVID conspiracy theorists and COVID deniers. I've even made videos about a few of them in the past, but they keep on going. And as long as they keep spreading misinformation, I'm going to keep addressing it. Before we get started, I just want to mention that the video that I'm going to be debunking today was recorded a few months ago. So while some of the claims might seem like they're outdated, they're actually still very relevant today, as we're about to see. And before you watch the video, know that I link all of the science and all of the studies that I talk about in this video in the description below. So make sure you check those out. With that said, let's get into it. This is really controversial. There's a lot of discussion that it's, this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated, and the unvaccinated are the ones that are driving these escape mutants. This is Robert Malone, one of the worst offenders when it comes to spreading COVID disinformation. I've made one short video about him in the past, and I'm going to be talking a good amount about him in this video. Here he is saying that it's not a pandemic of the unvaccinated, but the data say that it definitely is. There is no way you can look at graphs such as these and tell me that this is not a pandemic of the unvaccinated. The unvaccinated are the ones who are most vulnerable to disease. They are the ones taking up the space in the hospitals. They are the ones refusing the solution. It is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. If they get vaccinated and they have mild disease every time they get infected with COVID, there's no pandemic. He also says here that the unvaccinated are not sources of variants. This is both wrong and irrelevant. If the virus is able to spread easier, that means it's going to be able to replicate more times. More replication means more mutations, means more variants. Vaccines do reduce the spread of the virus. So reduced spread means less replication, means less mutation, means less variants overall. But that is all beside the point. It doesn't matter how many variants emerge. It doesn't matter how bad the headlines say today's new variant is. Vaccines can tackle variants. The vaccines we have now can tackle variants. And that's going to be a recurring theme I go over in this video. Here's my optimistic view on Delta. Yes, Delta's new variant is shaped differently. Technically, it has escaped the antibodies from the vaccine. This is Dr. Ryan Cole. I made a video about him before as well. He's a terrible person and a terrible source of information. For example, here he's saying that the Delta variant escaped immunity granted by vaccination, which is entirely untrue. Vaccines were still very effective against Delta. All of the data show that quite consistently. So we give a shot, give another shot, and say we're going to give a booster with the same shot for a virus that existed five variants ago. It's like saying to healthcare workers, we're going to give you a flu shot for the upcoming flu season, but we have leftover flu vaccines from four or five years ago in the freezer illogical. No common sense in that whatsoever. When will COVID deniers stop comparing COVID to the flu? It's not the flu. Unlike influenza, which has a completely new strain requiring a new vaccine every single year, SARS-CoV-2 does not have new strains yet. We just have variants. And the vaccines that we have right now are effective against all variants, including Delta, and yes, probably including Omicron. More on that later. Even if you're vaccinated, or you're not, we can equal opportunity get the virus now, vaccinated or not, and the vaccinated can carry equal or higher viral loads. Yeah, this talking point has been brought up a lot among COVID anti-vaxxers, and I've addressed it here on this channel before. But the short of it is that no, no one has actually measured viral load being shed from a vaccinated patient compared to an unvaccinated patient. What has been measured is viral RNA copy numbers. If you don't know the difference between those things, then you don't know enough to deny COVID vaccines. But anyway, here's what the data show. The data say that someone who is vaccinated against COVID but gets infected with SARS-CoV-2 has similar amounts of RNA in their nasopharynx compared to a unvaccinated person. Again, this is RNA, not live infectious virus. But once these levels peak at a similar point, then the vaccinated person actually clears the virus much faster than an unvaccinated person. That's because the vaccinated person is able to mount a fast memory response that is able to clear the virus before disease or more spread can happen. 
Now, since no one has actually measured infectious viral shedding from a vaccinated or unvaccinated person, how do we know so well that vaccines reduce spread? Well, we see it on a community level. Vaccinated populations don't transmit COVID as much as unvaccinated populations. So yeah, this whole thing about similar viral loads in vaccinated versus unvaccinated people, it's totally wrong. And yes, I know that some words by the CDC director herself fueled this very idea. And yes, she was wrong too. She made a mistake. This is why I say trust data, not people. Always either look at the data or listen to multiple different scientists if you are really serious about learning these kinds of things. This path that we're on, which is this sort of sort of monolithic uh, vaccine-only strategy, you know, we're explaining the science why that can't be the only solution. We cannot vaccinate ourselves out of this problem. This is Pierre Corey, the ivermectin guy. I made a video about him about a year ago when he testified in front of Congress calling ivermectin a miracle wonder drug when we had practically no data about how it worked against COVID. Fast forward to a year later, we have plenty of data showing that ivermectin does not work against COVID, unfortunately, and yet he has double, triple, quadrupled down on this drug. He is now directly responsible for all of the harm that ivermectin misinformation has been causing. So with what he's saying here, no one's saying that vaccination is the only solution. We need to have a combination of solutions. But make no mistake, vaccination is the most powerful tool we have in this pandemic. If everybody were vaccinated overnight, this pandemic would undoubtedly end. Because a majority of the population would have immunity against severe disease from COVID. And if no one's getting seriously ill with COVID, then we don't really have a pandemic, do we? Uh, this set of vaccines that we have right now, Moderna, Pfizer, and J&J. &J. Those are all gene therapy-based vaccines. <sighs> if I had a dollar every time I heard that. No, these are not gene therapy-based vaccines. J&J &J isn't even an mRNA vaccine. It's adenoviral vector vaccine. How are you going to call that a gene therapy? I don't know. A gene therapy is something that is designed to correct a genetic disorder. These methods rely on genetic modification of cells. These vaccines do not genetically modify cells. They just don't. And they can't. And yes, I know, I know, there was that terrible headline in Forbes last month, but the author was wrong. What he was referring to was a natural process where your cells that produce antibodies shuffle their genes around. What he thought happened, though, was that this is triggered by vaccination or exposure to a pathogen. This is incorrect. This phenomenon, which is called VDJ recombination, happens in the bone marrow naturally in the absence of any antigen. This means that this process is not triggered by a vaccine. It's not triggered by an infection. It's just always happening naturally. Moral of the story, vaccines don't change your DNA. They're not gene therapies. By the way, funny story about Dr. Malone here. When you're listening to him say these anti-vaccine nonsense talking points in this video, Remember that he himself is vaccinated. Yep, that's right. He got the Moderna vaccine. Just thought that would be important for anybody who believes him to know. We, as a community, need to protect these people at high risk. Not just here in our community, in our states, in my opinion. We need to protect the elders throughout the world. We don't need to hoard all the vaccine for people that don't really need it. He's so close to making a good point here, but at the same time, miles away. Vaccine equity is a huge, huge problem right now, but he's not really getting at that. He's saying that we don't need to vaccinate young people in America or Europe or anywhere. We only need to vaccinate elderly people and focus on vaccinating elderly people all across the world. This is complete nonsense. The only way to protect the most vulnerable people from infectious diseases like SARS-CoV-2 must involve a community solution. The whole community has to be in on it. Think of it this way. Vaccines are not 100% effective. I hope that's obvious to everybody, but they're going to be even less effective for people who are the most vulnerable in the population, which includes the extremely elderly, the immunocompromised, and people who have severe underlying conditions. These people are still going to be exposed to a lot of SARS-CoV-2 if they're the only ones vaccinated. But if everyone around them is also vaccinated, then SARS-CoV-2 is not going to have as easy of a time spreading throughout the population and finding those most vulnerable people. 
This has always been the ridiculously stupid flaw in any solution that involves only protecting the most vulnerable people. We need a community solution for a communicable disease. It's that simple. I'll just give a few statistics. There are about 330 children that have died of COVID in a year and a half. There's typically about 50,000 children per year who die. Many more have died of drownings. They have died of uh, car accidents. COVID deniers and COVID anti-vaxxers love to say that children are somehow immune to COVID. That is just not true. It is true that young children are among the lower risk for age groups when it comes to COVID, but that doesn't mean that there is no risk for them at all. When people choose to not care about a virus like SARS-CoV-2 and its case count increases in a community, so does the count of severe cases. And that's the case with all age groups, including children. Children can be hospitalized by COVID. They can suffer long-term consequences from it. And yes, they can die from it. But they can also be protected from it. COVID vaccination is really, really effective among children, and there were actually fewer adverse events observed in younger age groups than were in older age groups. SARS-CoV-2 is going to be around for a very long time. Your child will likely come into contact with it either now or when they're older, and when they eventually come into contact with it, you want them to be protected. Do they spread? No, children don't spread. There's at least seven different studies that show that essentially children spread to adults is close to zero, near zero, zero to one percent. I'd very much like to see those studies because the real data say the exact opposite. Children can and do spread COVID just as easily as any other age group, actually. I would also like to say I don't believe that there's anybody who's died who's gotten effective early treatment. Big red flag when someone says that their treatment or their solution is 100% effective, they are lying to you. Of course, Pierre Corey here is talking about ivermectin. He thinks that anybody who's gotten ivermectin early has not died of COVID. That is just completely wrong. We have clinical trials where ivermectin was given to patients who had COVID, and some of them actually died. Good so thing. you're treating vaccinated and unvaccinated Absolutely, patients. vaccinated and unvaccinated. And so I would say in July, the majority of my sicker patients were unvaccinated. And then I noticed in August, it seemed to be about 50-50. And now I'm noticing it's more vaccinated. And so it happened a very quick change in my practice. This is the problem with trusting people and not data. She might be telling the truth about her practice. Does her practice represent the larger picture of the world? No, it does not. The data clearly show that most of the people being hospitalized right now for COVID are unvaccinated. The data show that most people dying of COVID are unvaccinated. The most people with COVID are unvaccinated. I'm showing these graphs again because they are that important. The safety of the underlying technology is not yet fully demonstrated. It hasn't been fully characterized. Oh, yes, it is mRNA vaccines have been in the works for at least 30 years, each and every component being painstakingly tested and optimized by multiple teams of scientists throughout history. I'll provide links in the description to two review articles that very beautifully detail all of this work. But now, over a year later, we know that in the virus, this protein is responsible for much of the disease that the virus causes, the pathology in your vascular endothelial cells, the coagulation. This is extremely misleading. The spike protein in SARS-CoV-2 can cause problems, but it's because that it's in high quantities during an infection. In fact, the experiments he's alluding to here were actually done by injecting ridiculously high amounts of spike protein into animals. The amount of spike protein that your body sees in the case of vaccination is nowhere even close to that amount. It is actually minuscule when it comes to any adverse effects that the protein can cause. There are lots of more specific claims that people like Malone will make about the spike protein in vaccines. They are wrong, the spike protein in vaccines are not dangerous, but in order to address all of those claims I'd had to make a really long video. So instead, I'm just going to provide a link in the description to a very all-encompassing resource list. This source breaks down each claim and provides all of the data and actual scientific research required to demonstrate that that claim is wrong. Over 7 billion doses of these vaccines have been given worldwide at this point, and the whole time, teams of scientists from all over the world are closely monitoring the safety data. It is safe. 
you don't get much better data than that. Were women um, even included? Were pregnant women even included in the clinical trials? Of course they weren't. Uh, well, that's just a blatant lie by omission. Pregnant women weren't directly enrolled into the clinical trials because that's not normally done. No one wants to test on pregnant women for obvious reasons. But there were several women in all of the clinical trials who became pregnant during the clinical trials. And guess what? They were fine. Their babies were fine. There was no increased risk of any complications with their pregnancies. Since then, there has been a lot more data about the safety of COVID vaccines and pregnancy. And guess what? They're safe. Again, links to that data are in the description below. And the shot can damage the heart of children. There are more children who have had myocarditis, and there's never such a thing as mild myocarditis. That's inflammation of the heart. Once you get inflammation, you get scarring. Those kids' hearts are damaged for life. Ryan Cole is absolutely wrong here when he says that there is no such thing as mild myocarditis. There absolutely is, and that is exactly what we see associated with COVID vaccination. Meanwhile, with COVID infection, it is much more common to see severe myocarditis, which does have negative consequences. So if you want to protect yourself against severe myocarditis and those negative consequences, get vaccinated. The assumption that another dose is going to boost your immunity um, to levels that it was previously needs to be demonstrated clearly, and the safety of that needs to be demonstrated. It's not an assumption. Scientists don't make assumptions here. We test things. We are required to actually show and demonstrate these things. And all of those data are right there in the literature for anybody to read, including Malone here, who doesn't seem to like reading literature very much. And I will remind you all again, he's vaccinated. Malone got the Moderna vaccine, confirmed by his wife, admitted by him. He's vaccinated, and yet he's trashing vaccines anywhere he goes, because he wants to make and sell his own COVID vaccine one day, and he can't do that if the current vaccines work, which they do. And yes, they probably work against Omicron. Let me explain why I'm saying probably. We currently don't have adequate data to say that COVID vaccines will protect us against severe disease from Omicron. Those data are going to take time to gather. So in the meantime, the correct thing to say is probably. So why can we say probably? Well, we know that these vaccines produce a very robust and very durable immune memory response capable of producing a wide array of antibodies against a wide array of spike epitopes. We also know that most of the T-cell epitopes present in the spike protein in Omicron are conserved. If you don't know what any of that means, you don't know enough to justify not getting a vaccine. The short of it is, if you're vaccinated, your immune memory will likely be able to deal with Omicron just like it does the other variants. But until that data come in, just stand by for confirmatory answers. And for God's sake, don't read headlines. Listen to actual scientists. Listen to the actual data. Along with all the science that I talk about in this video, I'm going to be linking in the description some really great science communicators that are really good about staying on top of things happening with COVID and delivering quality information, unlike the people I just covered who give very terrible disinformation. So please, if you wanna learn more and are serious about your beliefs or have worries and concerns about the pandemic, check out those links. That's going to do it for this week's video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, I really do appreciate it. And don't forget to subscribe so that you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.